Good morning. Well, thank you. That's a very, very kind introduction, um, uh, it, which means I'm, I'm doomed to disappoint with that introduction. <laughs> um, um, thank you for having me here. I'm trying to figure out actually how to uh, um, um, best speak in this room <laughs> without giving anybody my back. But uh, um, so please forgive me as I uh, sort of uh, try to figure, figure out that uh, configuration. Um, um, it's really wonderful to be here. It's really wonderful to be here with um, um, Dean Ramachandran, who's an old colleague and friend. And uh, it's really wonderful to be here because I think what you're all doing is exciting. I think it's really exciting to start a, um, a new school of public health. I think it's, um, it is exciting to ponder the possibilities. I think it's exciting to figure out how the challenges that um, one faces in a project like this become opportunities. So what I thought I would do is I would talk a little bit about how I see um, um, the public health challenges in this post-COVID moment. My talk is not about COVID, but it is firmly anchored in COVID, as you'll see, because I do think that the past three years have really had important repercussions for where public health goes going forward. And we just had a very interesting conversation with our school leadership this morning, which actually sets up very, my, my, my talk very nicely, because I tried to ground my talk in my sense of the challenges public health has faced in a time of COVID and how those challenges should become opportunities for future directions for public health. And as you're gonna see in a second, I am using some terms which are small p political in my talk. And, uh, and I'm always very careful in my writing that uh, I do think that public health is political. That is different than being partisan. I think it's political from the sense of that public health has to engage with the forces that create the world around us. And I think there's no other word for that but to say it's political. Um, but I think that is an opportunity for public health to even in a time of very charged partisan moment for public health to really be relevant to the world around us. So with that in mind, I call my talk Within Reason. I will tell you just uh, by way of disclaimer right at the beginning, I have a book coming in November called Within Reason. So this actually talk presages that book a little bit. Um, uh, but I think as you'll see, you'll see why, why, why that name, I think that is exactly the space that public health should occupy in coming years. So let me um, move us forward. I'm gonna start by talking about liberal thinking. I realize, I, I'm, I'm actually quite well versed in the world, I realize I'm in Texas, and we say the word liberal, it, it gets you thinking a particular way. But I'm gonna make a case, I, I, I really do not think that the word liberal is a blue word or an anti-red word, not at all. I actually think liberal is a way of thinking that says that we are grounding our thinking in reason and data that we can use to create a better society. So I think it is actually a word that should transcend partisan colors. And that's how I'm trying to think about our political engagement. You know, the origins of this kind of thinking is also in pandemic. This is the plague in the 14th century Europe. You know, we, COVID was a bad time, right? And um, 14th century Europe, fully a third of 14th century Europeans died in the plague. That's a bad time when a third of people died. And, you know, we would like to think that in our fancy schmancy 21st century that we've moved along very much further. But, you know, we unfortunately haven't moved along that much further. This is... Um, Physicians um, wearing masks, I mean, they were sort of perhaps a bit more colorful, their masks, than they are now, um, trying to deal with the plague then. I mean, our, our, our basic tools, which is covering our face and trying not to get what's, what, whatever is around us, haven't changed that much since the 14th century. But importantly, in this moment of the plague in 14th century Europe, it also resulted in a lot of change in social structures, which is not that different than what we're seeing happening around us now. The feudal system, which was a system essentially of people who were indentured to work in, uh, in large sort of land holdings, ultimately came, was undone by the plague in Europe. For a very simple reason, actually, is that there were so many people who died that there weren't people to work in, uh, in these kind of environments. So employers had to renegotiate how they dealt with employees. Does that sound familiar, right? It's exactly what we've been going through as a world right now. This is again the 14th century. It also resulted in the creation of a lot of the art that now we recognize as classic art. This is sort of Daphne, Daphne fleeing from Apollo, classic art. And it resulted in a resurgence of science. This is uh, Michelangelo's Vitruvian Man, um, uh, which 
all emerged from the world sort of grappling with the aftermath of the plague. And it also came about with a lot of the writing that uh, ultimately shaped our thinking. So this is a John Locke's moral philosophy, um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, these are, this is the writing that ultimately became the foundation for what today we call enlightenment thinking. It all emerged from a pandemic that was sort of, that was as earth-shaking at the time as COVID has been for us. You know, the enlightenment ultimately bequeathed us with these sort of general principles, which is that there is a natural world which we need to understand so we can actually do better with it. Ultimately, human reason can help us get through difficult moments. Individuals are autonomous and have rights that we want to respect. And ultimately, through all this, we want to make our society better. You know, I would challenge us again, and I, and I, realize, I realize that we are in a charged moment, and I realize that you are all in an academic institution within a state which is grappling with some of these issues. But I would argue that things on the slide are not red or blue, that they actually apply equally well. I think there are one political party in this country would say the rights of individuals are central to our thinking. And I think that is, it directly comes from the Enlightenment project. The fact that we have data that should inform what we do, I think all parties subscribe to. The fact that what we're trying to do fundamentally is create a better world are things that all parties should subscribe to. And that is the Enlightenment that emerged from the plague. Now, my argument is, that public health actually is the paradigmatic liberal project. It is the project that is informed by these ideas, that individuals are autonomous, that we should use data as a way to create a better world. And that is exactly what the public health project is. And public health ultimately is the paradigmatic project of, that is informed by the ideas of the Enlightenment. So recognizing that, and recognizing that we are actually at a point where we are emerging from another plague, the question then becomes, what are the implications of this for public health? And you know, I use the word liberal, and I just wanna go back a little bit to the definition of liberal. The definition of liberal is willing to respect or accept behavior or opinions different from one's own. That is the definition of liberal. Now, for you all, this actually may be sort of a straightforward. In my environment, I come, I'm, come from Boston, it's very difficult for my environment to accept that, that uh, because people have a very clear, fixed sense of what it means to be liberal. Liberal means respecting autonomy of individuals and respecting differences of perspectives. And that is what liberal should be, and that is what public health should be. So I'm arguing here that public health should embrace diversity of perspectives, should embrace data, to the end of figuring out the best way to create a healthier world for everybody, not a blue healthy world or a red healthy world, but a healthier world for everybody. You know, the interest in the idea of liberal as a way of thinking has sort of waxed and waned over time. I guess that's the human condition. This is actually a, uh, an analysis of all books published, which now uh, Google Books allows you to do. And what you see is sort of there's this waning of the idea, and now there's sort of a, a resurgence of the idea. And I think that's good. I think it's good for us as a world to actually have a resurgence of going back to grounding in our enlightenment values. And I think public health should lead that much as it has over the years. You know, the roots of public health, many of you will recognize this. This is called the ghost map. This was uh, John Snow's map in mid 19th century London with a cholera epidemic. So, you know, the roots of public health, formal public health also come from plagues, so this is cholera outbreak. So when cholera outbreak in the, in the midnight central London in the 1850s, um, um, what John Snow did, for those of you who are not in public health, is he went around and he counted deaths. So if you look carefully at the streets, you see those like little domino-like stacks, those are dead people. And uh, this was what was called a ghost map. And by doing this, he was able to show the clustering of people dying from cholera that emerged from a place where there was a particular infected water source. And the myth is that he actually closed down the water source, which then eventually stopped the cholera epidemic. This, the real story is a little bit more complicated than that, but, but it's a nice story. Um, but it is very much right, grounded in data and reason that informed action, which ties back public health 
to this paradigmatic enlightenment effort. When this was happening, you know, right now, today, we're like, well, that's pretty obvious. We have to remember that nobody actually knew that there were microbes in water that caused cholera. So the idea that water was carrying some toxin that was causing cholera, that was, causing cholera was really transformative, right? It really was transformative. It led to Rudolf Virchow, who eventually sort of articulated that microbes were causing a lot of diseases, which really was a transformation in medicine and public health. But of course, the transformative path was rocky, as is always the case. So just to give us some solace that we think the moment is a difficult moment and we're arguing about things. You know, we've been arguing about these things for centuries. And, uh, you know, we're, we're the fact if we have not done so well in the context of this pandemic, there's been many examples where we haven't done well. This is data that led to perhaps the most important advance in the health of populations ever. The most important advance in the health of populations ever is hand washing. Hand washing came to us from Ignaz Semmelweis. Semmelweis, who was a physician, made this very simple observation. See the first clinic, second clinic? This is purpural fever, which is essentially postpartum fever, which was killing mothers. And he made this very simple observation that mothers in the maternity ward on one level of the hospital who were being delivered by nurses were had lower fever than the ones being delivered by doctors. And he said, why is that? Well, what he observed was that doctors were going from autopsies without washing their hands straight to delivering babies and in the process killing mothers. So he showed this data very clearly and he said, well, if doctors were to wash their hands, we would save lives. And of course, what do you think happened? Doctors said, of course, that makes a lot of sense. We see the data, let's wash our hands. Problem solved. No, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> doctors said, that is absolutely false. That's ridiculous. Ignaz Semmelweis, you're crazy. He was actually fired and he ended up dying in an, what at the time was called an insane asylum, um, uh, completely discredited um, uh, for having the temerity to show data that says that what should happen is we should wash our hands and save lives. So. In case we think that we are only being obstinate now about data that can guide reason, we have centuries of tradition as people of doing that. Um, uh, even data that was as clear as this. Luckily, we have persisted. Luckily, data continues to inform what we do. And luckily, data has led us to do some remarkable things. So now fast forward to the current plague. I mean, the current pandemic was marked by some truly extraordinary moments. For example, data led us to the development of highly effective vaccines in record time. Within eight months of a totally new pathogen, we got to vaccines that were 90, 95% effective, which, by the way, we had never done before. Like human beings, we had never done this before. We had never done vaccines in such a short period of time. The fastest vaccines ready for delivery ever had been mumps, which had taken about three years. So eight months was just really, really fast. So that's great, right? So like we had actually learned some things and data was leading us to a good place. Um, and by the way, although this was so quick now, it reflected the fact that we had invested in these technologies for decades before. This is actually a paper from 10 years ago. This is 2012 with the line in it, mRNA pre presents a promising vector that may well become the basis of a game-changing vaccine technology platform, right? So 10 years ago, we had been investing in these technologies, which is actually why they came to where we were, um, um, where we were today. So, you know, there's a line drawn from data long time ago, us fumbling our way through to data leading to solutions to the current plague. So that's by way of background. Now, let me talk about COVID. So COVID posed an enormous threat to this country. I could talk globally, but my talk is focused domestically. Um, I could show you this in many, many ways, but perhaps this picture captures it best. This was a picture from the New York Times. It was showing COVID was at one point in 2020. Um, um, and of course, they used red to show more density of COVID. And you know, if you were a, uh, coming from Mars to this planet and to this country, and you didn't know what this was about, and you looked at this map, you know it's nothing good, right? Like, like the whole country looks like it's on fire. And the whole country felt like it was on fire in 2020. We all lived through it, everybody in this room lived through it. And uh, it was bad. You know, more than a million Americans died from COVID and the COVID became the third leading cause of death in 2020 and 2021. 
If I were to tell you today that in 2025, there's going to be a disease that is called by a sequence of letters that you've never put together before. We had never put together COVID before, and that that's going to become the third leading cause of death in 2025. I think that should send a chill down all our spines, and we should all say, my goodness, how do we avoid that? And uh, you know, which country do I need to be in so I don't actually have to live through that? Because that's gonna be very painful. Well, that's what happened during COVID. So COVID was an enormous threat to this country. It was also a differential threat to different groups. COVID was more lethal for minority groups. This is looks at black white differences in the first two years of COVID. And if you just look at the adjusted, which is the, the reddish line, you see that uh, <coughs> black Americans had about twice the death rate than white Americans from COVID. And if you look at um, uh, drop in life expectancy, black American men had about a three year drop in life expectancy in the first year of COVID. Um, um, while um, white women had about 0.7 drop in life expectancy. 0.7 drop in life expectancy was unprecedented in and of itself. We had never had that kind of drop in 100 years. Three years is extraordinary. And as the data come in, um, Native Americans had about a six year drop in life expectancy in the context of COVID, which is truly, truly off the charts in terms of what we've experienced before. So COVID was a tremendous threat to the country. And of course, as this was happening, it revealed these underlying health problems. It revealed underlying health gaps, which resulted in this public outpouring of disaffection, triggered, of course, by the killing of unarmed men and women. But all of this came together in one moment where we, as a country, were faced with our mortality, faced with the enormous challenges that we faced, and faced with challenges that we've known were there for decades and centuries, but COVID brought them all to the fore, seemingly all at the same time. That is a moment of real threat. So COVID was a real threat to the country. COVID was also a real threat to public health. Now I could show you this in many ways, but I wanna show you just in a couple of ways. So my thesis was that COVID posed a real threat to public health as the paradigmatic liberal project, as a project that is based on reason, thoughtfulness, and the idea that we can create a better world by following data. Um, confidence in public institutions has been consistently going down, hasn't changed with red or blue administrations, it's just been going down. And confidence in public health, I would argue, has gone down dramatically. And how do I show you that? I wanna show you that with a picture of a sign outside the bakery in my neighborhood, which I frequent. So this is my, the, my bakery, it's called Clear Flower. And uh, here's the sign that they had on the door a few months ago. While we know that the indoor mask mandate has been lifted in Brookline, Brookline is the suburb of Boston in which I live, we will continue to require a mask to shop in our store until further notice. Now this is a bakery, which presumably does not have medical advisors, does not presumably have its own public health experts. And the bakery is saying, we know that the experts have said, you don't need a mask. But we, the bakery, disagree with the experts, and we insist you wear a mask. Now let me ask you this question. You're all looking at this thinking, hey, what's the big deal? Because I've seen it in other places. Think back to 2019. Could you imagine a non-health establishment in 2019 before the pandemic happened? Putting up a sign that said, the health experts say X, but we being the bakery, we being the store that sells shoes, we being the store that does something that has absolutely nothing to do with health, actually disagree with all the health experts and we insist that you do the following. Like it was an inconceivable, right? It was inconceivable that health experts would be so challenged by a bakery. That to me captures how public health found itself in a place in 2022, where the public is essentially saying, yeah, this great enlightenment paradigmatic project is in a place and we don't believe you. So I think we in public health have a real responsibility to say, wow, what's up with that? Why are we at this place? How do we fix it? And in the context of you all being in this very interesting place where we're starting a new school of public health to say, 
what role could you play in starting a school of public health that tackles some of these issues? So to try to address this, I want to say, how is it that we fell short on our promise? How is it, how did we go from Jon Snow coming up with a clear map to vaccines emerging so quickly, and somehow we went down the Ignaz Semmelweis route where things that seemed like clear as to what they should be, all of a sudden we're really not following through on that promise. And I would argue there were three reasons why we fell short on that promise. And the three reasons are false certitude, contradiction without acknowledgement, and intolerance of disagreement. So let me talk about each of those. Let me start with false certitude. So public health, during the plague, aka COVID, although I'm sure it did the same thing in the 14th century, leaned into, time and time again, into certitude, which time and time again was simply wrong. You know, I could show you, I could spend an hour showing you the simulations that public health put out that says we know exactly when the pandemic is going to end and we know exactly how many people are going to die. And every single time these projections were accompanied by somebody in public health saying this is the answer and every single time they were wrong. And every single time that person in public health who said that never went back and said, oh, I was wrong which of course creates a problem. It makes it reasonable for the bakery to say, eh, I'm not so sure I wanna to listen to you all because I'm, you know, I'm, I, I watch TV, I read the news and you've been wrong time and time and time again. It makes it reasonable for the media to start wondering whether or not public health should share the blame for some of the things that have happened because public health led with false certitude during the time of pandemic. Here is a piece from a paper, an academic paper, which I thought did a very nice job of capturing the fundamental problem with the methods behind that led to public health false certitude. With a lot at stake, it's wise to be humble when faced with fundamental limitations. Dynamic models, which is the models that were behind every single assumption about what's gonna happen with the pandemic, are usable as long as they take into account uncertainty of the assumptions on which they are based. If that's not the case, the results are on a par with assumptions or guesses. Everybody who is thoughtful methodologically knows this. And at the same time, in a moment of stress, we led with certitude, which was ultimately false and far outstripped our capacity of our models. And this comes in the annals of, we should have known better. Now, the defense that, that I think uh, people give is, to say, well, people needed these projections. People were asking for them. And you know what? If we told people we did not know, they would not believe us. Well, that's total hogwash. It's actually not true. People can handle knowing that you don't know. In fact, we even have science that shows that people can handle that you don't know. Here's a paper that shows this. There's a paper that actually looks at the effect of communicating uncertainty. Results show that people, when people perceive greater uncertainty was communicated, we observe only small degrees in trust and trustworthiness of the source. In fact, we compromised our trustworthiness more by false certitude. So that's problem one. Problem two, which leads from problem one, is contradiction without acknowledgement. We kept contradicting ourselves without acknowledging that we're contradicting ourselves. We kept doing this time and time again. I mean, the paradigmatic example was our contradiction about masking. COVID happens and we say, oh, no, no, you don't need a mask. Then all of a sudden we say, no, 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 actually masking is good, but without any effort to try to reconcile the two. And in fact, what most of us did is we just deleted the fact that we ever said that you don't need a mask. As though people are just going to forget. Well, people don't forget. They remember that you had just said two months ago and they remember and they're like, what are you talking about? Do you actually know what you're talking about? And I can show you this example after example after example. So contradiction without acknowledgement, number two. And number three, which is my least favorite, is intolerance of disagreement that we in public health, in no small part, because public health has drifted away from its enlightenment roots of actually being based on data and being informed by reason, not by belief, because public health in no small part has allowed itself to become partisan beyond political, has not allowed disagreement. Perhaps the perfect example of this was around the Great Barentine Declaration, which some of you may have heard about. So the Great Barentine Declaration which emerged from a number of scientists. These are scientists of repute 
in well-established institutions who put out the Great Barrington Declaration, which essentially said, well, this was in, the, this was in mid-2020, essentially said, well, could there be a way in which we deal with this pandemic by not restricting mobility for younger, healthier people who are not likely to get sick? Could there be a way to do that so that we actually get immunity out in the public? This was in direct contradiction with where public health mainstream was, which is that everybody needs to be protected at all costs. And this was met with resounding pushback from the public health establishment. This is a Union of Concerned Scientists calling the Great Barrington Declaration herding people to slaughter. Now, today, looking back, we know that since COVID started, more people have died of drug overdose than people under the age of 65 who have died from COVID. That is just data. Um, uh, which means that some of these ideas may not have been such bad ideas at all. But we did not allow space for their discussion or for their disagreement. You know, let me show you some things that the Great Barrington Declaration said. Here's what it said. Adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be the central aim of public health response to COVID. For example, nursing homes should use staff with acquired immunity. Staff rotation should be minimized. Retired people living at home should have groceries delivered. When possible, they should be family members outside rather than inside. Comprehensive detailed list of measures, including approach to multi-generation household, can be implemented. All of this is reasonable. And all of this was roundly rejected by public health because we were not willing to tolerate disagreement. And that, ultimately, led us to many of the sins of the pandemic years, including, for example, all the fights that we saw happening around schools opening and closing. Right? When, when you had people like the Philadelphia school commissioner trying to say we should reopen schools because kids don't get COVID, they don't get very sick from COVID, teachers looking after them are young. You had outcries, people saying we are teaching our students to death using terms of moral opprobrium to try to shut down perspectives that were different than, than the mainstream. So those were the three reasons how we fell short. Now the question is why did we fall short? So let's talk about why we fell short. Because I think it's important to ask ourselves why did we fall short? And three reasons why we fell short. Complexity of systems, our biases, and our groupthink. So let's talk about each of those. The problem is that a pandemic pushes us to think in our most reductionist way. Like in, it pushes us to our most reductionist brain. Because you know what? It's a pandemic. The cause is very simple. It's a bug, right? How straightforward is that? There's a bug. It causes bad things, right? It is the most linear of thoughts. But we forget that the consequences are within much more complex systems. And the perfect example of those much more complex systems are, has been around schooling, around the arguments in schooling. Now, again, I'm conscious of the fact, and I've prepared this talk specifically because I'm speaking here, in your political context, big P political context, that you're all dealing with, recognizing that these things have been argued um, at a partisan level. But the partisan, my point is that the partisan arguing has not been helped by public health because we have allowed ourselves to take positions that ultimately are based on belief rather than on data. Because when you think about schooling, it is entirely reasonable to be able to balance the risk to children, the risk to teachers, from the pandemic, as well as the risk to children from not learning. These are reasonable balances that we as a society make and we should be making all the time. This is actually from 2020. The green is 2020, the pink is 2019. These are math scores for children at different ages. And you see how the green is all shifted to the left. Best estimates are that kids have now lost six months of math learning across the board, which they're never gonna recover. And that has real implications for us as a society. And in particular, that is true for kids in minority schools. The, this looks at the top line are kids in uh, historically majority schools. This gray line are kids in minority schools. And the blue is the inflection that we created for kids in minority schools, which they're never going to catch up from. Right? So all of this is a direct consequence of our actions. Another way of looking at it is to see K-12 
kids falling behind, and this, the dark circles are schools, kids in schools which are predominantly kids of color, the blue cir light circles are kids in predominantly white schools, and you see the, the gap, the gap widening over time. And one of, the, one of the, the, the points that public health made was, well, you can put kids online, but of course not true, because kids, schools in affluent areas open sooner, and kids in uh, less affluent areas also don't have access to things remotely. So we created this educational shortfall. We created this widening gap for a condition where kids from COVID, death from COVID is lower than it is from all other things. It was much more dangerous for kids to be getting to school than it was for kids to be in school. Now, my point is very simple. Isn't this something around which reasonable people should be arguing? This should be a point of discussion. This should not be, this is not a, should not be a partisan point. This should be informed by enlightenment principles where we look at the data and we weigh the pros and the cons and weigh the pros and the cons of multiple different approaches. And public health should have been in a place of encouraging the discussion rather than being in a place of saying, no, there is no discussion. It's very clear what we should be doing because it was not clear what we should be doing at all. We know that if there's one thing that's going to protect lives, it's actually education. This actually looks at Hispanic kids, black kids, white kids, and this is just left to right as you get more education and the y-axis is mortality. More education, lower mortality over time. So now we have a generation of kids with less education, which means we're going to see the health effects of that for the coming decades. You know, it's then not a surprise that you have protests about schooling. So point A, point A, is that these are complex systems, not so simple. It's not as simple as bug, threat to, because of bug, therefore we should shut down schools because who's at the threat? What's the risk and what's the other risk for our consequences? That's part A. Second reason why we got this wrong is our biases, is our biases. So, you know, I, um, when I have students, this is a picture of uh, Congress, and I always ask students, say, you know, students are very animated by these things and say, you know, what, w which way is Congress not representative of the population? And people raise things, they say things like gender, which it's not, but it's getting closer. They say things like race, which actually Congress is actually not bad in representing race. Senate is harder, but Congress is not so bad. The area in which Congress is least representative of the population is on education. The dark blue is having completed a four-year college in Congress and in the country. About 35% of Americans have a four-year college degree. 96% of people in Congress have a four-year college degree. Now, you may say, okay, what's well, fine. We, you know, we want people in Congress to be better educated. That's true. But of course, that has real implications for the decisions you might make. Because I don't have a slide to show you this. The likelihood of being able, for example, to continue working remotely is directly linked to whether you have a four-year college degree. And it is then not a big stretch to say that when you have a policy, the, the legislative policymaking body in the country that sees the world in a particular way, it is very different than how the rest of the world sees the world. You know, we've, pr prior to COVID, we often had this argument, for example, about things like military deployments. It is quite one thing to say in the abstract, we're going to deploy young people. Quite another thing when those young people are your children. And the fact that nobody in Congress has, people, has kids who are actually in the military is a real problem. We face the exact same issue here. So that's number one, that's the biases of the people who actually have the power in this country, which see the world in a particular way. Coming back to public health and academic public health, this is um, political leanings of public health. Professor's associate assistant, and what you see is about 10% of academics overall see themselves as right, let alone far right, essentially nobody, so about 10%. There's only one institution in this country that is more left-leaning than academia. Anybody know what it is? Uh, the media. Only 6% of people in the media are actually on the right. Um, uh, so the media and academia are essentially 80, 90% willing to identify themselves as being on the left of the political spectrum. Of course, these biases influence how we do our, how we do our decisions and what we say. And the other part of the bias is that public health 
and academics, which is led by people with advanced degrees who make reasonable income, had a very different perspective on the pandemic than most people in the country did. And to show you that, now this is a slide for all the academics in the room, this is gonna make you unhappy, I know that. This is from a poll that looked at multiple axes. The different colors are mental health, personal finances, job security, take home pay, physical health, personal life, work life balance, okay? Below the line means things getting worse, above the line means things getting better. And what you see is it's different categories, right? Everything's getting worse for all categories, except there's one group in the middle where everything was better for them in 2020. And you know who that group is? People with postgraduate education. So those of us with postgraduate education, you know, it wasn't so bad to be more at home with your family. It didn't really affect our income. Our physical health, we started exercising more, right? That is the truth. I know, I know. You can throw things at me afterwards. You're going to say, no, no, it was terrible. I know it was terrible. But it wasn't bad in many ways. And that is the perspective that those of us who were in positions of authority in public health brought to a world which actually was suffering significantly and that we were not personally experiencing. And by the way, that of course ties in a lot with race and the groups who actually were bearing the burden of COVID, which was not the people who were making decisions. This is epidemiologist today, which is the dark blue line is white, the red line is Asian. So you see about 75%, about 80% of epidemiologists are white or Asian, which is of course the groups that had the lowest burden of that from COVID. So that's the second reason, our biases why we did so poorly. And the third reason is groupthink, is groupthink. And the groupthink and absolutism led us to say things that we shouldn't say. One of those most dramatic things is zero COVID, is the notion that we could eliminate COVID, which was endorsed in editorials in all the leading academic journals, including places like Lancet, which had an editorial about zero COVID. You can look it up. Um, uh, where we said we can eliminate COVID. There was never any reason to believe we could eliminate COVID. We only ever eliminated two diseases. One is smallpox, the other one is another one, which I can remember was pretty obscure. And uh, the, those diseases were not transmitted through animals. It's actually next to impossible to eliminate diseases. It's also transmitted through animals because we have all these vectors around us. Um, uh, there's never any notion that we could eliminate COVID. Um, uh, the notion of eliminating COVID, I've used in my writing, became a bit of a spherical cow. I don't know if people know the spherical cow joke. Spherical cow joke is like, um, it's a village in France, depending on cows, and cows stop producing milk. It's a crisis for the village, so the mayor, she's like, oh my God, this is terrible. She goes to the university, asks for a panel of distinguished experts to come to her. Panel of distinguished experts comes, yes, we need to study the problem, give us six months. She's like, oh my God, six months, okay, fine. You go off, come six months. The panel of experts comes back, sits down, and the mayor's like, she's like, okay, I've been waiting for the answer, what's the answer, and the lead, uh, of the panel expert, academic expert says, before we begin, you have to assume a spherical cow, which of course is not the kind of cows that the mayor has in her village, which makes the, the panel of experts utterly useless. Um, that is exactly what zero COVID was like. And zero COVID was not a joke. It actually resulted in terrible things that have happened in countries like China that have used zero COVID as a way really of advancing political agendas, resulting in truly catastrophic results then as they realized that this was unsustainable. And this was pushed forward by our absolutist thinking. And I would argue that this absolutist thinking actually comes from some of the polarization that we have as a country and the fact that, again, public health has a particular political bent which becomes a belief which separates us from the data. On the top is people who vote Democrat and the bottom is people who vote Republican. What this slide shows is the percent of people who vote Democrat or Republican who know people only like them. 19% of Republicans live in neighborhoods where 100% of people vote Republican. 38% of Democrats live in neighborhoods where 100% of people vote Democrat as well. So when you have that kind of polarization, it's not that difficult, right, to become, to have these kind of beliefs. Now, you all might actually, for this might all be natural to you all. In my environment, I live in Boston, when I show these kind of data, people get very upset. So then I actually show them this survey, which was done before COVID about counting tolerance in uh, in the United States, and the most intolerant county in America actually is Suffolk County, Massachusetts, which is actually where my school is. Okay. <laughs> so, now I'm gonna start concluding. So, within reason. So this is what I think the, the, the solution is, and I suppose this is what I'm hoping 
that a new project like yours, a new school of public health, could embrace? Um, I think three things. Epistemic humility, radical compassion, reform through reason. So let me talk about each of them. Let me talk about humility. You know, we, there is so much we don't know. And we can do a lot of good despite the fact that we don't know many things. But it becomes very difficult to do that when we think we know everything. And you know, the media and academic public health complex kept doing things like this. You know, what are epidemiologists doing for Thanksgiving? What are epidemiologists doing for Christmas? And you know, it's very hard to be humble when uh, everybody wants to know what you, you know, what you, how you're basting your turkey. Um, um, the, uh, you know, I like this definition. Epistemic arrogance is the tendency to overestimate our ability to predict when we're overconfident. And I think, I, I would like to think that this phrase captures public health's entanglement with COVID. I hope you all see it and you're like, huh, yeah, that sounds about right. We overestimated our ability to predict when we were overconfident. So I think a forward-looking public health post-COVID needs to be humble and needs to be, and needs to lead with that humility so that people can regain our, so we can regain trust and people can trust us again. That's number one. Number two is this concept of radical compassion. And the concept of radical compassion says this very clearly, that we should not be advocating for decisions. We should not be making decisions, should not be making recommendations that are not grounded in a deep appreciation of who is suffering from what we're recommending. You know, COVID happens and uh, we say, my God, this is a new infectious disease. We don't know what's happening. Everybody stay indoors, right? Now, this was March of 2020, uh, 2020 when COVID happened. And what you see is the immediate separation about who can actually stay indoors. The gray line are the wealthiest 20%. The, the red line are the poorest 20%, right? The wealthiest 20% of the country can stay indoors. The poorest 20% less so. Now, this was urgent in the time of new pandemic. So you're like, okay, it's a new disease, fine, right? But very quickly, the pattern began to form. This is, this is not new data. This, this existed, this was widely available. Data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Your ability to work remotely is directly linked in a dose-response relationship to your income. See that? Bottom 25% all the way to top 25%. Which means a radical, compassionate approach should have, at every point in the pandemic, made us ask, how is what we're recommending affecting whom? And if we're saying that the solution to a new infectious disease that is scaring us all is that everybody should work remotely, we need to realize that when we say everybody's working remotely, what that means is our friends. Because we are on the far right, and those are the people who could actually work remotely. The majority of the country never had that option. And while we said you could work remotely, you know what happened? Everybody who could not work remotely died. So these are the people who died in COVID. Construction workers, bus drivers, manufacturing workers, laborers, material movers, drivers and truck drivers. These are sort of by squares of people who died in COVID, right? So we, it, it, it was not academic public health people who set the intellectual stage for this. And a compassionate approach should make us realize that this should be how we think. And also that what we're recommending results in enormous consequence for people's lives in the economy. This is like, looks at the dip in employment and then the persistent unemployment for people of low income versus people of higher income for whom employment um, uh, persisted. And a radical compassionate approach says, what is the full spectrum of what's affecting people's lives? This is overdoses, which you see we're going up over the past 20 years, then we're getting a handle on it, and then went back up 30% in the time of in the first year of COVID. Health is shapes all dimensions of people's lives and it's the fullness of health. People don't really care if they're gonna be sick from COVID or something else. People care about being healthy and sick, period. And we forgot that. And that is what compassion should make us think and feel all the time. And my third and last point, I'm gonna conclude and stop, is that ultimately, Actions we take need to be based in reason. They need to be divorced from uh, belief. And we need to recognize that things take time and actually creating a better world takes time. You know, I published this uh, piece um, uh, in, uh, in the middle of, uh, of uh, COVID about the, the fact that radical vision of public health requires an incremental approach. And uh, I was uh, 
roundly lambasted for it because uh, the mood of public health was uh, much more of a warrior mood saying, it's not tolerable to do things incrementally, that we actually want to do things quickly and we have the right vision for the world and as long as the world listens to us, the world will be a better place. And I think that's nonsense, I think it's not true. I think a humble public health that is compassionate, that recognizes that, dif that different people bear disproportionate suffering in a, time, in, um, um, in a time of pandemic or not, is one that is willing to invest in the long-term hard work of doing the things that need to be done to create a better world. And that's what I'm hoping that uh, all schools of public health do. So what I'm trying to do in my context is school of public health and what I'm hoping that you will do with yours. Um, um, this is the book that I wrote during COVID, which actually captures a number of these ideas. Um, um, and uh, the book Within Reason is the one that's coming out this year that sort of then takes them and uh, really brings them forward, hopefully in a way that's useful to our community. I'll stop there, I'll take questions, challenges. Thank you.